Hey guys, Mark here, Celtic Crossbows. We're going to be looking at on this issue at the Whip Crossbow. It was a 14th century device, forerunner of a goat's foot crossbow, and something which used a device like this called a whip. It was made from uh, traditionally yew, um, it was lightweight, strong, um, and unlike oak, it was not uh, custom to split in when it got dry, so it needed a lubricant as much, not as he stayed on long enough um, in combat to need lubricating. So stay watching, we're gonna get straight into this. In the 14th century, 15th century, crossbows wasn't just one style and that was it, no matter what people's general impression were. Like today, with, with polymer based crossbows, uh, steel, custom wooden stock crossbows, match crossbows, competition crossbows, they took a, a lot of different styles depending on what they were used for. What we've been following up to this point is the traditional munitions grade crossbows. These would have been the ones built from a tiller or a blank of this type. And this is a lovely bit of uh, mahogany. And this will be coming along in the next couple of weeks into my next project. The beauty of these was, this basic design was, you could use a different uh, bowling depending on the size of the metal you produce at the time. It wasn't like today, don't forget, where there was thousands of miles of steel produced off of mills and things like this. These was hand forged, hand beat steel in blacksmiths. And whatever came out of the mill is whatever the blacksmith made at the time with the material he had at the time. If he had enough to make a 500 pound prod, he would make a 500 pound prod. If he had enough to make a 100 pound prod, he would make a 100 pound prod. So what went into the stock or tiller was whatever the bowyer or crossbow smith would come up with at the time. Okay, so the arbalist at the time wouldn't have done everything himself. He would have made everything from scratch. He would have given specific specs to different departments like you would on a production line on a factory today, like such as Ford or uh, Honda. One company would produce the engine, another company would produce the body, and it would all come together in the factory. And the arbalist done the same thing, and he would choose the components to what was required by the individual who had commissioned him for the job. Had it been the king who had commissioned him for the work, then a hundred stocks would have come in. They wouldn't have been tailor-made to each individual. Um, a small stock would have had a hundred pound bow for it, because perhaps that's all the cut-off was from a tree that was left over. Perhaps it was too small to make a thousand pound windlass crossbow, but it was adequate to make a hundred pound self-defense crossbow. Just like this one. This is a 120 pound self-defense crossbow. Um, quite narrow in the hilt. Um, slender in the limb. And this would have been a personal weapon for somebody who was on sentry duty on the gate of a castle or in the corridors where there wasn't enough room to use a whip or something like this. And you need a quick reload to down, pull your string, back up and fire. So this would have been um, your beginner's crossbow, if you like. So you just joined the army, 14 years of age, and this would be one of the first weapons they would have been using if they hadn't been trained in the art of archery or swordsmanship. They would have been the infantry of the day with their personal weapon. Okay, a few things as well which signify the difference from something like a poacher's crossbow, which is what this 120 pound crossbow is, as opposed to a military crossbow. And it'd be something simple, as the tickler. Now here I'll look at the quality and the finish on this tickler. Um, this is a beautifully blacksmith piece, um, curved, drawn to a point, twisted, and a lot of the time and effort. This would have been an expensive crossbow in 1500s. We would be looking at about two months wages for this 120 pound crossbow. However, now at the, the whip crossbow, and the first thing you notice straight away is the thickness of the stock. If I bring up the young sheet, it's a lot thicker than the stock. Um, it's a very pretty green of wood. It's 
not the best quality grain of wood because this was a munitions grade. The army didn't want the finest quality, they wanted quantity. And that's what these were produced for, these were use for killing. Um, it wasn't the most accurate of triggers for releasing. All you had to do was put the bolt on target. So you are looking now, you can see the difference straight away in the thickness of the steel in the bow limbs. Uh, these are about uh, one and a half centimetres thick, all the way at the end. And I can show you this is a 375 pound draw. This was the forerunner of a goat's foot before the goat's foot design had been thought of. And it's essentially exactly the same crossbow, and all they'd done was drew a pin through the stock and made a cast iron lever or pressed steel at the time to lever over. This with the whip, the whip simply went in front, let's put that down, it would lock into the string here, into the front and lever from there to bring it back down which I'll show you in the next video when I go outside wearing a bit of dry weather to take this into action. So this was the real true frontline weapon if it was like this was the sniper rifle of the crossbow world at the time. When we look at this munitions grade crossbow in particular it's just a straightforward hammered steel curve not much thought went into it. This was purely weapons grade. It had to be functional, nothing else. It wasn't made to look pretty. Just by having a standard hammered or forged tickler took a day's cost off the making. So when you're producing thousands of these crossbows for the army, at a day's wages of each one for the blacksmith for the tickler, it was a massive saving for the government which wouldn't have been paying for the finest quality of the time. It like I said, everything was cut bare bones in basic. Even the chrome cap, which some of them had, or, or hammer steel cap, to protect them in the ground, they didn't have it because of the simple reason they didn't believe these would last long enough. In whatever I mean is, that all you want was a, a cannon shot or something like that to hit the stock. Um, soldier killed, dropped in combat. The enemy would pick it up and use it. The government, Oil King, didn't want the best weapons going to the other side. So again, it was made to a budget and to a purpose. Okay, the next thing we're gonna look at is ammunition. Like all armies of the world today, the government will pay for your ammunition. Your standard basic munition. If you wanted top grade, state-of-the-art um, sniper ammunition, if you're a sniper, Nine times out of ten, even in the army today, you pay for it yourself. Now here we have an example. Modern crossbow bolt. This wouldn't be, this what I got here, this is one of mine. This wouldn't be issued back in the 1500s to, in the, the day. Machined aluminium, high tempered steel, um, state of the art technology. Government wouldn't have paid for that. They would have gone straight for basic wood, ha, forge hammered tip, throw away, cost pennies. Because they was produced in the millions, quite literally. Thousands would be shot in a case of an hour. Now, looking at the size of the difference, it says for a modern day, a steamboat stinger, 55 pounds upwards, um, 130 grain bolt. This is a 1500 replica for a 120 pound medieval crossbow, Arbalest. Difference in size, um, and it's virtually the same power because you got 120 grain steam bolt a day. The difference is, this was designed to carry momentum. It's momentum that drives through the target. And then we compare then to the bigger um, 150 sorry, 375 pound crossbow bolts um, weighing just over a, a thousand grains um, cast iron tip um, oak shaft 
this is a solid oak shaft um, versus a beech. And the difference between kinetic energy on impact on target is massive. The difference on hitting on target today would be equivalent of a modern day 9mm, which is roughly the diameter of the shaft, versus a 7.62. And all this travels a lot slower when it hits the target, wherever it hits is going down, because it got the momentum to carry on through. So although physically and visually the modern day crossbows look a lot sleeker and more sporty and fire the balls faster, at the end of the day, it's like a racehorse versus um, an old nag. They still won horsepower, but the racehorse after one mile of racing will be knackered and can't go any further. It's run out of momentum. But whereas the, the trusty old um, nag uh, will just keep on plodding and they'll just keep pushing on through. And this is the same thing as we got with the modern day crossbows. They're not designed for the heavyweight bolts. They won't do it. Or if they do do it, they haven't got the elasticity and the momentum in the modern day Kevlar springs um, bowling to push it forward. And that's with the old cast iron or steel limbs, going to be cast iron because they just shatter. It's with the old steel limbs um, retain their energy. It's a bit like a cart horse versus a racehorse. A racehorse could not pull a cart, it hasn't got the strength, the torque to get it going. Whereas an old cart horse has built up different set of muscles and it'll get it going. Won't do it fast, but it'll keep it going. And once it's going, it's harder to stop. So one, one last look at this uh, girl before uh, you see the next video of her in action. Um, again, you can see the size and the difference of the limbs compared to a modern day crossbow. Um, over one and a half centimeters wide, and only two centimeters on the center across the riser and you can see uh, a good idea of the side proportion if I can use my thumb as you can gauge there how thick the steel is um, the thickness of the rope um, of the string and the tension already on this is immense even at rest is massive tension on this uh, the nut is about twice the size of the 100 pound crossbow and again, the fibres on this are laying perfectly in the line. If you look at there, the fibres of the stock are perfectly in the line. The reason being is, again, part of the arbalist skill was to match the right stock to the right limb. For the amount of shock and energy going through the stock, the power and torque from the limbs will just split the stock right away down if all the fibers are binding together right. Hence, the reinforcement at the front of the ear with the bolts driven down through to prevent the fibers splitting the stock. The, the, the shock energy going through here is immense. On 375 pounds of draw, um, when it's, it's, it's uh, loosed, the, the return energy um, is immense. You will literally cut your fingers off on the return of the limb. We'll be shooting from a place called Avod Arven Farm. It's uh, in Clanath, Avod Tuleri, and is where King Charles I hid where he's been chased by Oliver Cromwell and his men before he was executed and displayed on the tower. So. That's where we're going to be at to next, guys. It's my local shooting spot, as you've some of you have seen it before. So until then, thanks for watching, don't have nightmares, and please click like and subscribe. Diochavau, poil.